So just one quick word on our reading, and then uh, we want to delve into something in our gospel today. But in the book of Exodus here, we have Moses interceding for the people. So uh, as we've heard a number of times in the last couple of weeks, uh, Jesus, not Jesus, obviously not Jesus, it's the Old Testament. Uh, God frees the uh, Jews from slavery in Egypt. They're out in the desert. Uh, He frees them through miraculous signs, the ten plagues. Uh, the crossing of the Red Sea, the pillar of fire, pillar of cloud, all just marvelous signs, the man in the desert, the quail, water from the rock, and the people continuously complained. And rather than crying out to God in prayer, they complained to God. So there's a difference. Like It's one thing to say, you know, we have a need, God, it's your fault, or we have a need, God, my Father, uh, come to my aid, come to my assistance, help me. There's the two very, very different attitudes. Uh, so the people, unfortunately, tend to just grumble against God, complain against God. Why did he bring us out here to die? So it's an awful, awful attitude to have uh, in, in front of such marvellous, as I say, selfless, uh, just gratuitous generosity on, on, on God's behalf, uh, on God's side. So here we have Moses talking to God, and God informs Moses, by the way, the people that, we, that, that, that I freed... They're down below after making themselves a calf of molten metal and have worshipped it and offered it sacrifice, saying, Here is your God, Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. I can see how headstrong these people are. Right? So you can imagine, like God the Father, like, what else do I have to do for you, you know, to show that, that I will take care of you? Now, sure, you will experience times of need, and that's also, this is also true for us today. Just because we follow the Lord doesn't mean everything is plain sailing. We will have times of need. There will be occasions of persecution. Uh, there will be occasions of misunderstanding or misrepresentation. Or read the history of the church. Like it's, it was, it's, not, it's, not, it's not always very straightforward. But I will always be with you. Come to me, all you who labor and are overburdened. I will be your God. You will be my people. Do not worry. Okay, but so often they, 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 they just, they just like, as I say, complain against God rather than turning to him. And the psalm then remembers this, which I, I think the, the psalm is actually, it has a small bit of humor. It all depends on how you read it. It says, they fashioned a calf at Horeb and worshipped an image of metal, exchanging the God who was their glory for the image of a bull that eats grass. You see it? You see the kind of the contrast here. You know, the God of glory in exchange for a bull who eats grass. Right. I hope that that juxtaposition is clear enough. You know, they're really kind of laying it out. You know what I mean? How stupid a thing to do that was, you know? A calf, a bull who eats grass. He really didn't free you from, from Egypt. It wasn't him. He had nothing to do with it. He wasn't even there. Right? You know, it was God. Okay, so they're, they're just going to lay out how, how stupid an action that is. Okay, and yet today, yet today we're not exactly a, a exempt or free from, from a similar temptation where, where the God, the creator of all things, who is our loving Father, can be substituted for really stupid things, for things that are really unimportant. Be the success, notoriety, likes on Facebook or social media, like these are the things that we, we, we search for, we, we, we long for, uh, to be wanted, to be loved, which are in and of themselves good things, in that we have been created to love and to be loved, so we long for these things, but we go looking for them in the wrong places. We go looking for that love and fulfillment in the wrong places, and it just ends up so empty, so plastic, so fake. And then we wonder why it's, life just isn't, it's just not, it's not fulfilling. Why, why not? Because we've been created for so much more. We've been created for God, for a divine love. We've been created in his image and likeness, to be like him, to love like him, to be merciful like him, to be compassionate like him, and to be sent out in his name. So our calling is fantastic. A couple of little stupid clicks and likes under the picture of my breakfast makes absolutely zero difference to my life. You know what I mean? Who cares? Like you take a picture of your Insta breakfast with your little, what's it called? Pout and peace and peace and pout. That's it, isn't it? That, that's, how, that's, how, that's what the youth of today say. It's, I won't do it because someone will, <laughs> someone will take a still screenshot and that'll be, that'll be me ruined. Um, but it involves the pouting of the lips and doing this at the same time. Okay, you'll see it around. Okay, so. Uh, uh, yes, so. 
these kind of things are just entirely unimportant. They really are unimportant. And yet they can occupy such a, a large part of our heart, you know? This desire to be wanted, this desire to be, to be loved, and then to fulfill it in all sorts of stupid ways that don't fulfill us, that empty us, and actually lead us often to sin. Okay, so this is, this is not God's plan. God's plan for us is one of healing. God's plan for us is one of actual, authentic fulfillment, which will last for all eternity. That's God's plan. Way better than ours. Okay, so we've really got to kind of sub substituting God's plan for a bull that eats grass. Okay, really not important. What I want to actually hone in on today, if I may, because uh, I think I'm going to have to go, I think I'm going to go over time, here, is that uh, Jesus says so clearly, right, in John's Gospel, it's just, it's just so blunt, I love it. Uh, he just says, as for human approval, this means nothing to me. As for human approval, I don't care. I just don't care. It just means nothing to me. And I just, I, when, I, when I hear that, I go, go Jesus. I love that. Like, I just, I love that. Like, because we can't, uh, you know, if Jesus were to be completely swayed every direction by popular opinion, well then, sorry, is he, is he the way, the truth, the truth and the life? Or is he the way, the popular position and the life? The way, the democratically decided decision or position and the life? Or is he the way, the truth, objectively, whether you like it or not, and the life? So when Jesus comes, like, his, his job isn't to be super popular. That's not what he was, he wasn't even trying to be popular, right? As for human approval, I don't care. I don't care. That's not, that's not what I'm here for. I'm not here to be popular. I'm here to represent the Father, to show who the Father is. I'm actually here to die for you. Okay? So it's, it's, a, very, it's a very interesting thing because I suppose when we think of Jesus generally, we have this fairly politically correct uh, image of Jesus in mind, you know, who's helpful and nice and, and heals people and finds sheep and does all these wonderful things. Okay. But the Jesus who, who doesn't care about popular opinion, the, the Jesus who rebels against not so much it rebels against the authorities at the time, that's a little inaccurate, more highlights to the authorities at the time that they had strayed, that they, like, he highlights to the most powerful people, people who actually had the power to kill him, he's highlighting to them that their ways are hypocritical. So he doesn't really care about popularity. Now, in Palm Sunday, yes, we will see him welcomed into Jerusalem with great fanfare and great rejoicing, but those same people will turn to him within a week, will turn from against him within a week. So he, he, he doesn't care about popular opinion. But at the same time, Jesus is called to be a leader. So I think this, this, is, a, this, this is an interesting kind of a dynamic, and with like so many things in our faith, it's this question of balance, right? This question of balance. On one hand, Jesus is called to be a leader, as in he has to form his apostles and, and bring the church into this, this, this new phase of its history, right? So from what we call the Old Testament into the New Testament. So the, the, Mos, the, Mosa, the liturgy of, of Moses, the Mosaic uh, Passover and that, into what we now have as the Mass. So, so Jesus did have to change things. He did have to lead people. So he has to be, on one hand, a leader. In order, for, in order to be a leader, people have to follow you. And on the other hand, not care about popular opinion. So you have to be a leader but not pay, care about popular opinion. And that might sound almost like a contradiction in terms, but it's not. Is this not what every leader is called to do? So for a parent, for example, if you have a four-year-old or a three-year-old who sticks their feet in the ground and says, no, I'm not going to put on my coat. I don't care if it's minus eight outside and there's a gale blowing. I don't like that stupid coat. I'm not putting on my coat. And you say, well, if that's what you want, that's okay. And out you go, and he gets his face blue, and his hands blue, and he falls down in, in the snow, gnome. Uh, right. Is, you know, is, that, is that what a, a good parent would do? No, you're going to find a way of... Now, what we'll do is we'll put the coaties on, right? Everyone's going to get their coatie. Daddy has his coatie, and Mary has her coatie on, and I have my coatie on, and now you're going to get your coatie. I don't want my coatie. <laughs> and you, you find a way of, 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 of encouraging them, or as we'd say in Irish, claw mossing them, and you, you just find a way of, of, of using your feminine genius if you're a woman, using your stern voice if you're a man, of, of getting him to put his coat on, right? Coat now. Um, but so you're, you're leading, and, but you're not, 
it's not, you're not doing this just to be popular. Like, you're not trying to be popular with your kids. In fact, I, I've, this is ha I've seen this before, where, where parents forget that they're not supposed to be their children's friends, if you will. They're supposed to be their children's parents. So if you're just kind of hanging out with your kids and being as immature as them and being as irresponsible as them, that's not good parenting. Okay? Which doesn't mean you have to be obviously dominate over them. That's not what we're talking about either. But you, you have to lead from the front. So it's a very interesting thing to look at when we look at uh, the church uh, in its present situation. There's a lot of talk about you know, co-responsibility and, and these kind of things. To look, at, to look back to Jesus' leadership. On one hand, he is a leader, absolutely. On the other hand, he, at the same time, he doesn't care about popular opinion. So how do we do this? How do we do this in the church? Because all of us in varying degrees and in various responsibilities are called to lead, all of us. So just to, to look briefly at Jesus' leadership style uh, and how we can look at, how we can extrapolate from that uh, examples that, that we can follow as to how to be leaders in the church who love the Lord and at the same time aren't just playing to the crowd and trying to be popular because that just ends, that ends in disaster, always has, especially in the church. So... The Lord's approach in leading people was three main titles, right? Win the people, build them, and send them. Win, build, send. So he'd win his apostles, which for the most part scripturally seems quite easy for him actually. He tended just to look at them and say, follow me. And that was kind of it. Um, but we'll have a look at, the, at the, a couple of the details in a second. So win them, build them. So by living by example, they see what you're talking about, they see how to do what you're calling them to do, and then send them out in your name. Okay? So this is, this is how Jesus leads. So keeping in mind, we're, we're avoiding these two, uh, or we're, we're keeping in mind these two um, lines that are kind of out of bounds, you know? Just playing to the crowd, uh, or, or uh, yeah, just trying to win popularity, which, which is, is pointless, or at the same time, pushing everyone away. Neither, neither extreme are good. So he's being faithful to God, leading the people, loving the people, and at the same time, not doing all of this because he wants to be popular. He wants to be faithful. It's different. He wants to be faithful to God rather than popular with the people. So uh, if we have a quick look at Jesus' leadership as regards winning people. How did Jesus win people? It's always important in any of these kind of parish renewal things that are going on now, or diocesan renewal, or synods, and all these kind of things. <clears throat> the f I think one of the most important things to identify right from the beginning is, why are we doing this? Why? Identify your why. What is this for? As in, what's the goal we're trying to achieve here? So when Jesus spoke to his apostles, he spoke about like, the kingdom, the kingdom coming here on earth. God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven. God's kingdom, the kingdom is here in your midst. The restoration of the kingdom. These, these kind of terms often came, often came up in, in conversation with, with the apostles. That there's, there's, something, there's something big happening here. This isn't just like we'll come together, we'll have a nice time. We'll help, you know, our, our primary ministry is healing ministry. No, that, that was never it. They're, they're, they're establishing something maybe bigger than, than they, they even knew. Did they know that the church would go well beyond the boundaries of the, the Holy Land? Jesus said it would. To the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. How? But like this, the why, the why was huge. The why was amazing. The why was eternal salvation. That was the goal. So when you think of like parish renewal today, why do we do this? It's not to be popular. It's not to have lots of people in our club. Uh, it's not to give lots of people stuff to do and make them feel important or make them feel happy. The, the, the restoration of our church, it's about the salvation of souls. If that's not clear, don't even start. Waste of time. It's about the salvation of souls. So in Jesus' leadership, he starts with this, with this win, right? This approach of winning people. And his goal is clear. His why is clear. 
The apostles could see it right from the beginning, right? He's restoring the kingdom in people as well through healing them. It's not, he's not just healing them because they're sick, but you know, like, like the paralytic, your sins are forgiven. So it's not just I'm giving you your health back, but I'm, I'm restoring your soul. Okay, so he, his why is clear, his goal is very clear. Secondly, as a good leader, you must live it. You must live it yourself or no one will follow you. I mean, you can't have, and this is kind of the, the, you know, the, the, the tragedy of maybe the island of the 40s and 50s. Do you know what I mean? What's the first commandment? Love the Lord your God. <laughs> you know what I mean? And the love of God has been bet into you. Like, sorry, it's just a complete contradiction in terms. You can't beat love into someone. You know, so if we're going to show that our faith is oriented around love, we must be loving. If, if we want to show that the heart of our faith is, is this loving, merciful, compassionate God who is Father, then we must act that way. So firstly, our goal has to be clear. Secondly, we must live it. And I think these days especially, good leadership will always involve suffering. So he who bleeds, leads. If you want to lead, but never want to actually put in any great effort, just kind of lead from the back. There's, there's an expression in, 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 in Italian. Apparently, uh, Napoleon said this, uh, but he said, are, are we ready? Yeah, are we set? Yeah, off you go. You know, right? So he gets them all charged up, and then, you know, apparently. Uh, that's an expression they have anyway. So this idea like that, you know, you send them into battle while you run away. That, that doesn't work. If you want to lead, lead from the front and bleed. And you know, again, not to be quoting too many movies, but you think of your gladiators or your brave hearts or that kind of thing. These men were so inspirational because there they were out in the, the battlefields, risking their lives and bleeding for their people. And that's why they led. That's why the people would, would, would rally to their cause just because this man was leading. Okay? So the goal is clear. They're leading by example. They're suffering or bleeding for it. And ultimately, if people are going to follow you, they have to know you care. That's even true, strangely, in the business world. That when you're getting people to do their job well, you're not doing so just to increase profits or just to uh, so, so manipulate them to achieve something for you, but you're trying to encourage them to achieve something which will help them, it's going to help their career too, if they do their job well. It's going to give them a, a greater sense of satisfaction if they do the, their job well. It's going to give, give them a greater sense of ownership if, if they use their experience to try and come up with good solutions and so on and so forth. So they have to know you care. Did the apostles know Jesus cared? Absolutely. Absolutely. For a man can have no greater love than to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. That's what Jesus himself said. That's what Jesus himself proves. Okay, uh, I've probably gone over time today, so I'm going to stop it there. Um, we might pick this up tomorrow. So Jesus leadership, uh, that we just covered win. Uh, we've build and send to do tomorrow, so we'll have a look at that. Oh, tomorrow, St. Joseph. Ah, perfect. Great leader. Excellent. So we'll have a look at that tomorrow. Uh, in the meantime, we pray in a particular way uh, for all of our, our parishes, uh, many of whom are going through very difficult times at the moment with no mass attendance and not being able to have meetings or organize anything, no youth groups, no, just, just, it, it's, a very, it's a very difficult time to try and do everything virtually when what people uh, are, are so hungry for is, is, is a relationship. Um, such a difficult time for, for, for many parishes that when they're trying now to renew the life of the parish, that it might never be actually about playing to the crowd or simply doing what's popular. That will end in failure. If we want to win people, our goal must be clear. We want to get to heaven. If we want to win people, secondly, we must live it. We must be people of love, charity, prayer, selflessness. If we want to win people, we must be willing to bleed. We must be willing to suffer for this, which, on, which these days probably means taking a bit of a hit on social media at times for posting a, a pro-God or a pro-Catholic post, whatever it may be. Yeah, and you may lose friends. That may happen. And ultimately, if we want to win, those who we hope to lead must know we care. So we ask the good Lord to renew our church, renew our parishes, renew our own hearts, 
because the conversion of the world starts with me. Amen.